Welcome to this new podcast series brought to you by the Electrical Safety Network. I'm Dave Austin, and I'll be hosting the programs along with Gary Gundry, technical author and trainer who brings insight from the contracting world and specialist knowledge from BS7671 The Regs and on-site guidance. In this special program, we reveal what's in the Second Amendment to BS7671, published on the 28th of March 2022. There are many changes, so we're going to focus on some of the most significant ones. And to consider them, we're very honoured to have John Bradley, Chairman of JPL64, the committee that pulls together the work of all the panels and subgroups to decide what goes into the final document. John is a Sparks through and through, starting in 1965 as an apprentice at the age of 15. He took over the chair of JPL64 in 2015, and he will relinquish the role once the new book is out. There can be no better person to give us the background thinking to the changes. Here's a taster of what you'll hear. Now, in amendment number two, it's being spelled out. You, you really shouldn't be using type AC. Protection against transient overvoltages should be provided unless the owner of the installation declares that it is not required due to the loss or the damage being tolerable. In principle, we could certainly see a third amendment, but that'll be a couple or three years down the road from now, I would think. John, the Second Amendment is now in the public domain. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, you're most welcome. Glad to be here. Let's start right at the start. There's an interesting introduction about the fact that the Amendment 2 will be implemented immediately and then the word withdrawn is used. So this is the first time we've seen a withdrawal. What was the thinking behind that? Uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting one. The way it's normally done, uh, the new requirements apply for installations designed after a certain date. There was a perception um, in the committee that this could be misused, this could be abused, uh, possibly by a developer who says, well, we did all our designs for our houses or whatever it might be five years ago, and we're just carrying on using the same designs. Now, really what's happened is the way it's handled in BS7671 now is very much the same way it's handled in many other British standards. And that is to say that the current version, the Blue Book, remains current and will be withdrawn on the 27th of September. And after that, it's a withdrawn standard. Uh, Withdrawn publications are not considered to be current and they don't have the status of a a British standard. Uh, But whether they continue to be used or not is a contractual matter between the electrical contractor and the client, whoever the client might be. Ah, that's interesting. So it would still be permissible to work to the Blue Book, but that would be an agreement only with the customer, effectively. That's right, yes. I mean, it, there's some guidance issued by BSI on withdrawn standards. Um, and, and what that says, in fact, is it's important to use the current edition of a standard so that you're following the latest guidance and that using a withdrawn standard could leave you open to accusat- accusations of professional negligence or non-compliance with contractual terms. So, Gary, has that been a problem with contractors in the past, do you think? Uh, No, most people actually do take on board this installation date and all designs after a particular date are acknowledged and and abided by. But as John's nicely put it, there's been a number of developers that have bought land up and were insistent that their designs were still okay to be implemented after a particular date but as a practical example it would have been they were using like plastic consumer units so obviously um, when the amendment came in in 2015 for um, metal clad consumer units they were still fitting plastic ones which didn't seem right and then obviously with the larger projects you know that, that could run many years for example Hinkley Point Power Station is an example I give it would have been designed on the 17th built and constructed in the 18th and probably commissioned in the 19th. So contractually, there has to be a statement that um, people follow and if underneath the requirements that John's articulated there, we pulled some words from page two 
uh, just to reiterate the, the importance of a contract and how it can be used, especially on longer term projects. So most people buy it, but obviously there was a little bit of a loophole and it was felt that it was better to implement it this way. Gary, we've seen a change of the scope of arc fault detection devices and increasing of the scope really in 421.1.7. What, what, what is the scope now? Yes, since 2018, there's been a recommendation for these devices to be installed in any, any particular type of circuit. But now we're seeing that we're just going to move away from a recommendation to a requirement. And this is for single phase AC final circuits that supply socket outlets with a rated current not exceeding 32 amps. And they will be applicable into four t particular types of building. High risk residential buildings, HRRB for short. Houses in multiple occupation, HMO for short purpose-built student accommodation and care homes. So John, what was the thinking behind that change? These are types of premises where the consequences of fire in terms of risk to human life could be, there could be a greater probability of, of danger to life or, or serious injury in premises like that. And um, you know, coming back to the whole point with AFDDs, they protect against the risk that other types of protective device that we're more familiar with, like fuses and circuit breakers, um, SPDs and RCDs, don't protect against. And that is uh, dangerous arc faults that can lead to ignition and consequently lead to fire. Every big fire starts as a little fire. Indeed. So it's, it's, it's very much protecting the people. It's less concerned with the buildings, more to do with buildings where people have to be got out quickly. Yes, absolutely. Understood. And RCDs, there's a bit of a change there. And I see what, what, DC components are becoming a bit of a plague, aren't they? So what is it that they, that's happened with uh, RCDs, Gary, in 531.3.1? Yes, for many years we've been advised to use type AC RCDs for general use, but with the introduction of digital motors, switch mode power supplies, they've been introducing DC currents within the installation, so it's been affecting the coil, the detecting coil in the RCD, so they become blinded or a little bit confused so they don't always operate so we're moving away to a new type of RCD called type A and that now is a little bit more flexible and I think it can cope up to six milliamps of DC so it's better for certain applications now the um, requirements have been reworded so we don't just say you can't use a type AC uh, because obviously that would be wrong to do that but they have to be limited to resistive loads to make sure that they're not going to be affected. So John, this is a, an interesting one in that you are reaching the end of your tenure as chairman of JPL 64 after a long yes. and distinguished career. I don't know if you greet that with happiness or, or sadness, but <laughs> you, you, uh, I, I won't ask you to answer that. But a bit of both. You, you, a little bit of both, that's good. Uh, you've seen such an arc of technology and the fact that we've now got more and more DC components um, appearing in our AC systems, it's a sign of, of the way things are changing, isn't it? It is, absolutely, yes. I mean, you, you've got equipment with, uh, with switch mode power supplies. I mean, that's responsible for a lot of the problem. But um, essentially, any kind of current using equipment that uh, produces a, a, a current waveform that's distorted, that's to say it's not just a straightforward sine wave, if it produces a distorted waveform, well, a distorted waveform is made up of harmonics. And so you've got these harmonics present in the current. I mean, Gary has mentioned um, type A RCDs, but they are the minimum that should be used. There are type uh, F, which deal with high frequency uh, residual current. And there's type B, which deal with the type of residual current that um, you can get from uh, inverters, for instance, of solar photovolta photovoltaic system. Right from the 18th edition, the regulations were quite specific that you'd got to select the right type of RCD, whether it be A, C, A, B or F. But... Um, now, uh, in amendment number two, it's being spelled out, you, you really shouldn't be using type AC 
unless you know absolutely for certain that there won't be any DC components in the residual current. And uh, that's going to be a very limited uh, yes, it's quite of a, load. Quite, quite a difficult it call is. to make that, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I think what was quite difficult to understand for some readers of BS7671 was the fact that it used to say you should use at least a type A, all right, which was given, it was almost projecting that there was a hierarchy. So as John's just elaborated that A is the lowest level, then it goes up to an F, and then the highest one with the all-encompassing features is the type B. So it's nice to see that it was spelt out better rather than just saying at least. Lovely. Uh, let's turn to surge protective devices. What changes have we seen there? Because this has been quite a saga too, hasn't it? We've had quite a bit come in about them and go out. So where are we with section 443? So in the 18th edition, when it first introduced, protection against transient over voltage was, was required where the result could be in four areas. Now, what we've done this time is reduced it to three and specified it a little bit clearer. So now number one is serious injury to or loss of human life. Number two is failure of a safety service. So it's emergency lighting, fire alarm system, and there's as those are defined in part two. And number three is a significant financial or data loss. So what we've resulted in now is lost the one with the co-located number of people. And then for all other cases, Protection against transient over voltages should be provided unless the owner of the installation declares that it is not required due to the loss or the damage being tolerable and that they accept that risk. So, John, this is interesting, the introduction of the word tolerable. That very much puts the onus then on the, on the homeowner, but the conversation has to take place with the contractor to find out if they believe the risk is tolerable. Yes, that's right. I mean, it, it was considered that... Um, you might get a very simple installation where the cost of SPDs just wouldn't be justified. Or you might get a client who absolutely doesn't want these things for one reason or another. So it was thought proper to give an opportunity not to install them if the customer thought that the, that the, the risk of damage was tolerable. It's, it's beholden on the electrical contractors not to try and lead the client down this path. And bearing in mind, with, um, with many installations, a, a domestic installation, it might well be that only one SPD is required for the whole installation, and that's uh, in the consumer unit or, or immediately adjacent to it. So it's not necessarily a very costly affair. It's a very rare occurrence, I'd imagine, that the cost of the SPD would be greater than the risk of losing data, particularly in a home computer or whatever. I mean, these are this is where the word tolerable now encompasses not just financial value, but also the cost of inconvenience. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Absolutely. I was going to say, John, most manufacturers seem to be or offering a service where they can install these into the consumer unit already, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. Now, we have a whole new part to get our teeth into in Part 8, uh, particularly in uh, Chapter 8.2, which is the, uh, the, the, the nuts of it, really. But what was the thinking about Part 8, John, and why did, we, why did we not see it in the 18th and now it's come in Amendment 2? What was the delay, as it were? Well, this is the, it's a completely new chapter. It's chapter A2 and uh, about prosumers' electrical installations. But the, the point is, prior to the 18th edition, it just wasn't available as, as an international standard. This is based on work in, in IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission. And um, so it's an, it's an international work and it's been implemented or the technical intent of it's been in implemented in BS7671. But it's time for this sort of thing, isn't it? Uh, I think it is. I, I'm interested in, again, your arc of experience because you must have sat in hundreds of meetings by now where this has slowly been evolving as a concept. Uh, how, how, where are we in the scheme of things across Senelec, across Europe, in terms of how advanced are we moving down this road versus some of the other European countries or indeed other countries in the world that you know of? Well, we're about the same. So we are, we are at about the same stage. And technologically, 
I don't know technologically. I suppose you go out to some countries in the world, some very large countries where you have may have large swathes of of the country that have no mains electricity supplies and they're dependent on generation. But really we should we should be talking about what a prosumer's electrical installation is, shouldn't we? And what is a prosumer? According to the definition in the wiring regulations, a prosumer is an entity or party that can both be a producer and a consumer of electrical energy. So really what you've got is an installation which incorporates its own means of generating electricity or, or has access to uh, a means of generating electricity uh, perhaps that serves a, a number of adjacent buildings or premises and um, it's also got loads that consume electricity and it may also have a supply from the ordinary distribution network. Yes, I think the thing that surprised me is is the bigger picture of not just somebody with some solar PV on their roof generating, storing in batteries and using in that sense, but this idea of communities getting together and having a small micro-generation facility which then links in into a smart grid. That's the, that's the big picture, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It could be communities. It could be, um, it could be a shopping centre or something like that, or a, a, a number of residential premises. I mean, it really is. You know, if you you just let the imagination go, and it's all on the table now. Do I you mean, find that an exciting time. thought, John? As you, as again, as yeah. you, as you, as you end your time having to worry about these things too much, how do you, how do you feel about the future? Does it feel exciting or does it feel daunting? No, no, I don't think it's daunting. I think th things are changing. The most common form uh, was was micro generation, such as solar PV or wind turbines, that have been uh, incorporated in the installations for reasons of feeding back to the grid. But this this brings the prospect of having solar PVs or wind generation that uh, isn't primarily for feeding back to the grid but can also supply your own installation when your installation has been islanded from the grid. Yes, uh, Gary, island mode presents some interesting challenges particularly in terms of the earthing. What, do, what does the uh, chapter 8.2 say about that? when you're disconnected from the electricity supply. So what in effect then you use, you lose the live conductors, but you may not be able to rely on the earthen arrangement that's been provided because obviously the cable could have got damaged. So you need your own source of earthen and obviously it needs to be reliable and effective in the events of faults. So I presume that it's um, going to build on... I, I don't know how much detail is in part eight on that one, John. Well, uh, I mean, part eight links with, with other regulations in the book. Does it feed back to 551 with the generators and the earth electrodes? I think there are regulations that reference 551. Yes, it is. It's a point back to that. There's also specific requirements about if you switch between island mode and, and working with the DNO, the, the way that the earthing is switched as well. Oh, so the importance yeah. of that. You wouldn't want to break... Um, your earthen arrangement until it's all, all electrically connected. So there is a set sequence for that, yes. Yeah, so the earthing is broken last, line neutral, earth, earth made, then neutral line. That's the Yes, sequence. that's right. You mustn't disconnect earth before the live conductors and then reconnect the live conductors until protective earth is reconnected. So there's not a lot of technical stuff in, in Part 8, but it's it's worth a read because it certainly signposts an interesting future, as you say. Jim. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are, uh, there are concepts in there. I mean, Gary's already alluded to the different uh, types of operation. You're either taking a supply from the grid or feeding back to, to the grid, or you're operating in island mode. And you can have it for a, an installation that's on its own or an installation that's working Collectively. in conjunction with a number of other installations. So you can have an individual prosumer's installation, a collective 
mm -hmm. uh, prosumers installation where a number of separate prosumers installations are, are considered as, as a consumer installation. They use a common source of local production um, instead of having one each, as it were. Or you can have a, a shared prosumers installation where the owners or operators of several individual premises may group their interests and they accept to share their supply with their neighbours. So you might get to a source of generation in, in one of the premises and it's being shared by neighbours, uh, presumably with some sort of financial and I'm imagining that the, the role of the national grid in years to come will be simply to manage all this micro-generation and make sure it's all working together. Um, that's certainly a role that um, uh, uh, what we used to call, what, well, what we still call uh, DNOs or um, distribution network operators. Well, they're, they're going to become DNSs and Gary Mark be able to remind me what the S stands yeah. for. Uh, yes, I thought I wasn't sure whether it was going to go to DSOs. There's been a little bit. No, of I think a... you're right. Oh, yes. right, okay. Yeah, so distribution s system operator. So if you wanted to boil it down into simplicity, when you're a consumer for the DNO, they you consume it, it just flows one way. Well, now we're going to be flowing both ways, bi directional. So I think they're transitioning through that process. So you will read in part of chapter 8 too that there's a reference to DSO, but mostly it's DNO. Uh, and obviously, when, when I was editing this, I was a little bit concerned we had the mismatch of that and wanted the clarity of it. But we're sticking with DNO for the majority of the cases. And if you do read DSO, it's not a typo. It, it is specific for that point. And going forward, we'll see things slightly change. But whether that happens this year or, or in a couple of years... We, we, we will see. Uh, one more area I'd like to look at, John, is Chapter 6.4. Gary, the, there's insulation resistance testing and amendments to the requirements for testing RCDs. Just fill us in on what those changes are. Yes, essentially what's happened is that there's always been a requirement for the installation to be tested at 500 volts DC. But when you're installing cables, along the way, you end up connecting electrical equipment and some of the electrical equipment has electronics in it and the operative at the, after the event doesn't want to inject 500 volts into that equipment so they reduce the voltage to 250 volts because that obviously marries up with the main supply and that's felt that that was good enough but that's not the requirement so I think it's been split now hasn't it John so basically we want the cabling tested at 500 and then the equipment as a second test. Yes it's important that the, the, the cabling is tested at 500 volts after it's been installed because that's the point when it can be damaged by chafing or compression or torsion or something like that. So every cable has to be tested at uh, 500 volts DC or 1000 volts if it happens to be in a circuit that's rated at more than 500 volts. And that test should be carried out before any sensitive equipment that is connected. And when we say sensitive, we mean equipment that could uh, interfere with the test result or that could be damaged by the 500 volt insulation resistance test. Now, after that equipment has been installed, the circuit uh, only has to be tested at 250 volts DC you still have to have a one mega ohm uh, reading as an absolute minimum. It's been made clear. There was a lot of uh, thinking in the committee about this, about what was really important. But the cable manufacturers were, were quite adamant that, um, you know, when cables have been installed, they should be given a 500 volt insulation resistance test because that reveals any damage caused during the installation process. So it's like a two-stage test, isn't it? I mean, I'm looking at the words now. It says following connection of equipment. So as you've dictated there, 500 volts for the conductors, and then after the equipment's been connected, you do another test. I mean, that equipment itself could have damaged the cables, couldn't it? And the testing of RCDs. We've lost I-Delta uh, 5 
t five times testing, rather. Uh, yes, yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, it's it's been simplified, and um, it uh, again there was a lot of hard thinking about this, but um, it was considered that uh, if an RCD is tested simply at I delta n um, and not at 5 I delta n or even half I delta n, um, then the, the, the ordinary I delta n test is fine. It, and the RCD should operate within the required time. 300 milliseconds? Um, now, yeah, for, for, um, for most RCDs, it, it's 300 milliseconds. I should clarify that. That's, That's right. for the 61008 and 61009 series. And then BS4293 used to be 200 milliseconds but I mean I think that's right uh, yes most people yes. would pick that yes. up on periodic so but for, for new installation work we should be using the 300 millisecond standard John so. we've mentioned a couple of times that this is uh, this is the end of your tenure as chair of JPL 64 and I, I was jokingly saying I wouldn't ask you to commit but how has it been what, what are your reflections as you look back over your time in charge um oh well first of all a tremendous privilege I mean um when when I started, when I were Nort Brit a lad, <laughs> I started as an apprentice um, at the age of 15. And I really wasn't clear what the IEEE wiring regulations were at the time. I pr pretty soon uh, learnt that when I went to college. But these regulations were made by the Institution of Electrical Engineers, which sounded very grand. And when you look down the list of committee members at that time, I think the, the, the chairman was quite likely to be a colonel somebody or somebody from a different sort of background, I would think, from mine. So uh, I'm glad to say we're, we're more inclusive these days. And um, so it was a great privilege for me to, um, uh, to have the opportunity to, to chair the Wiring Regulations Committee. And... Um, it certainly can be um, a, a, quite a, an interesting job sometimes. I mean, the, the job of a committee chairman, a technical committee chairman, uh, his first duty really, his or her first duty, is to establish consensus. Consensus is not to say that the decision of the committee has to be unanimous, because you might never achieve that. But you have to reach a solution that everybody can live with. There is a tendency for use of the wiring regulations to imagine all the representatives are, are there on behalf of the IET. But that's not the case. I mean, you only have to look at the list of members of the wiring regulations, and they're always printed uh, at the front of the wiring regulations, and they come from all sorts of organizations not only the IET itself but manufacturers hospital boards the health and safety executive consumer safety organizations and they have all sorts of different interests to represent but they're all there to produce a safe set of wiring regulations a set of wiring regulations that will produce installations that are standardized and um, are safe and will function correctly there's you will know because i'm sure you you speak to a lot of people in the industry that there's a a feeling amongst electricians that we have too many updates too many changes well, why is it that bs 7671 has to be updated on such a regular basis much of the content of bs 7671 is based on international and european standards for low voltage electrical installations. Uh, the international ones come from IEC, International Electrotechnical Commission, and uh, the harmonized documents, the European documents, come from what's called CENELEC. And what CENELEC does, uh, although it does develop some standards of its own, uh, much of the work in CENELEC is to adopt IEC standards and adapt them for Europe. And um, once something becomes a CENELEC standard, 
and the ones we're interested in are called HDs or harmonization documents, we have an obligation to adopt the technical intent into our national wiring regulation. So John, with all this harmonization to be dealt with, all these different committees and countries to deal with, how long does it take for this process to work to get a reg out? Yes, I mean, typically it takes um, somewhere between two or three years, I would say, uh, possibly a bit longer, but um, we have to decide a, a cut-off date beyond which we won't take account of any new work. But all all the the stuff coming from I from Senelec particularly has to be gone through um, from the point of view of implementation in BS seven six seven one, and it has to be looked at for the standard of its English and um, for how well it fits in with the way that we do things uh, in the UK. I mean, our wiring regulations are applied in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and in fact in some other parts of the world as well, Cyprus for instance. We also have some new UK requirements uh, coming in. I mean, this. Um, I think what we've talked about with, with RCD testing, the simplification there, um, that's a particular a UK regulation, if I recall correctly. So, John, we got Amendment 1 to the 18th pretty swiftly, 722, all about EV, and that came out only within a few months of the launch of the uh, 18th edition. And now we're on Amendment 2, only four years down the road. What's the future look like? Do you think we'll be on to the 19th quicker than maybe the 10-year period that it usually is? I would think... Before we move on to the 19th, we, we, we may see another amendment. I mean, with British standards, it's generally accepted you can go up to three amendments before you have a new edition. So it could go either way, really. I suppose it depends how long it takes. But um, in principle, we could certainly have, see a third amendment. But that'll be a couple or three years down the road from now. I would think. With maybe a little bit more filling in on part eight. Um, yes, well, I know that internationally there is, um, there is a more advanced version of part eight or, a, or a, certainly of eight two uh, prosumers installations. Uh, chapter one of part eight is energy efficiency, which... Um, in the 18th edition, including in this Amendment 2, is an informative uh, appendix in BS 7671. It may at some point be adopted into the body of the wiring regulations as part of Chapter 8. If you think back over the time you've been there since 2015, or maybe perhaps before because you've been involved before, what, what what's your proudest introduction what what have you driven personally that you're you're very pleased to see there oh goodness <laughs> now you're asking well <laughs> i won't go to the other end of that there's question been... and say what's the one you regret the most <laughs> yeah. no, there's been, really there have been so many of these things i, I think um, i think prosumers installations that's um that's an important one Really? Well, that's quite a legacy um, to be leaving, isn't it? I'd say that's going to d direct yes, our futures for many so. years to come. Yes, it will do. Yeah, but I mean, there have been lots of developments. Actually, I've been in, involved on the wiring regulations committees and its subcommittees for quite some years, and th there are things that I've been very pleased with. I mean, on wiring systems, um, uh, cables buried in walls at less than 50 millimetres from the surface within the last 10 years or so there's been a lot more clarity added there about permitted zones for wiring to be run in unless it's in steel conduit or a, a cable with a metallic sheath 
so that we've got a, a much clearer picture on that and the use of RCDs to protect that wire and to provide additional protection in case somebody should drive a nail or a screw into the the cabling in the wall. So a lot more clarity been added there. John, you've been very modest. You, you know, I've been involved in the committees for sort of, I don't know, 10 years now, and you've, you've written some really good regulations. The clarity, the simplicity, you've kept it tight. It, you've, you've had a massive input into the wiring regulations. And on behalf of the committee, I know you're going to have a formal one when you depart, but everybody does respect you. You, you, you've had a, a massive input and we're very grateful. Thank you. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Our thanks to John Bradley for a fascinating insight into the thinking behind Amendment 2. And we wish John success and happiness whatever road he takes after JPL 64. Well, I hope you found that podcast useful and interesting. We didn't cover all the changes in Amendment 2, so please consult the book for full information. And do look out for further podcasts from the Electrical Safety Network. I'm Dave Austin. Thank you for listening.